ونشهد ان سيدنا ونبينا ومولانا محمد عبده ورسوله اما بعد فاعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وما اتاكم الرسول فخذوه وما نهاكم عنه فانتهوا صدق الله العظيم سبحانك لا علم لنا الا ما علمتنا انك انت العليم الحكيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي دروس يقل Respected brothers, respected elders, mothers and sisters listening at home In our last session of Dars e Hadith We covered a very important mas'ala The mas'ala of Sajdai Tilawat When a person recites certain verses of the Quran Sajdai Tilawat Prostration becomes according to Hazrat Uthman bin Affan radiyallahu ta'ala an prostration is farz according to the fuqaha Imam Abu Hanifa rahmatullah alayhi says it is wajib and according to Imam Shafi'i, Imam Malik, Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal rahmatullah alayhi all the three say that it is sunnah so according to the majority of the scholars it is sunnah but in the fiqh of Imam Abu Hanifa it is wajib and what I wish to carry out again or just to continue with some of the masail which are the opinion of Sayyidina Osman bin Affan radiallahu ta'ala an and are also his fatwas fatwas that he gave during his khilafat so for an example inshallah tonight I want to cover a very important subject that is of a complete different theme I know I have it just in front of me after a few weeks you might be wondering what's happening but let me just uh, enlighten him that we have been discussing some of the fatwas that have been issued by Sayyidina Asman bin Affan radiallahu ta'ala an and because they are important masail I wish to uh, elaborate on them so that it could benefit all of us inshallah ta'ala Sayyidina Osman bin Affan radiallahu ta'ala an was very conscious of hygiene it is said that he was a man who was in the habit of doing ghusl every day he was in the habit of doing ghusl every day in fact, it was famously known about Sayyidina Uthman bin Affan radiallahu ta'ala an that from the day he had embraced Islam until the very end, Hazrat Uthman radiallahu ta'ala an never missed out from doing ghusl. He was very hygiene conscious. As far as clothes were concerned, itar, applying perfume, making sure that the body is maintained and clean all the time, he would perform ghusl every day and therefore inshallah I have chosen to speak on this topic of ghusl a lot of a lot of us take some of the basic masail to be granted thinking that we know everything we know how to do wudu and we know how to do the correct manner of ghusl but subhanallah if, some, if someone was to question them to explain the sequence of wuzu and ghusl 
only then it will be apparent to him that there are a lot of mistakes in his manner of wuzu and also ghusl and so it is important that in the light of the hadith of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam we understand the sequence of how Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did ghusl now one is ghusl that a person wishes to do just for the sake of maintaining cleanliness and hygiene and another ghusl is known as ghusl janabat where the sharia commands him and it's an order from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that ghusl becomes farz on that individual and janabat would mean the seminal discharge if semen was to discharge from the private organ then that person would be rendered to be in the state of janabat Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has explained in his beautiful kalam the fara'is of wuzu which are four and have been mentioned in the Quran which I will not repeat and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also speaks of the importance of ghusl Allah says وَإِن كُنْتُمْ جُنُوبًا فَاتَّهَرُوا If you are in that state of janabat as in major impurity then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says فَاتَّهَرُوا فَاتَّهَرُوا Immediately do ghusl Immediately do ghusl فَاتَّهَرُوا means to carry out all the procedures of ghusl mentioned by Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the manner how Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would do ghusl which is very important for us to understand and inshallah what I wish to cover tonight is a few ahadith of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on this chapter of ghusl Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha who is the wife of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam she is the one who has narrated this hadith and has explained to the ummah the manner of the ghusl of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam she says kana izaktasala min al janabati bada'a faghasala yadayhi when Allah's Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was in the state of janabat and he would do his ghusl then the first thing Allah's Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would do was to wash the hands now washing the hands to the wrist is very very important even in wuzu we start off by washing the hands if your hands are clean then inshallah everything will be clean if your hands are dirty then of course it is with your hands that you are going to clean every part of your body so your hands have to be clean and Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam first would wash his hands now here the riwayat that I have the narration this is the narration recorded in the Sahih of Imam Bukhari. Now, Imam Bukhari, rahmatullah standard of hadith is extremely high, and it has to meet with his conditions for him to record any hadith in his book of Jami us Sahih. And how Imam Bukhari, rahmatullah actually works is that he has a pool of a hadith. He has a a pool of a hadith. And a very intelligent man, subhanAllah. And from the ahadith, with the pool, the selection that he has got, he would actually take out fiqhi masail. Uh, he would take out uh, the important uh, masail that affect all the Muslimin, Islamic jurisprudence, which is called kate masail. And this is the manner how Imam Bukhari rahmatullah alayhi works. So in this riwayat, there is no mentioning of what Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did after washing the hands. But again in uh, a riwayat which is recorded in the Sahih of Imam Muslim, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's habit after washing the hand was to wash the private parts. Was to wash the private parts. So after washing your hand when you are in the, uh, in the bathroom, in, the, uh, in a shower cubicle or whatever, it may be a tub, then what you do is that you wash your private parts. What is meant by washing the private parts is that if there is any impurity in any part of the body, first you have to wash that out. So wash your hands and then wash your private parts.
parts. That is the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then the second sunnah, the third sunnah of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is ثُمَّ يَتَوَزَّعُوا كَمَا يَتَوَزَّعُوا لِلصَّلَاةِ And then Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam before performing ghusl, he would do wuzu like how one does wuzu for salah. Now this is the sunnah of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam of how he would carry out the ghusl. So for an example, if a person was to miss out from doing wudu when he would do, when he would carry out his ghusl, be it ghusl janabat or any other ghusl bathing, if he misses out from wudu, his ghusl would still be valid. His ghusl would still be valid. Because the, the scholars have mentioned that the fara'is of ghusl is how many? Three. How many? Three. Jazakallah. And, and the fara'is of wudu? Four. The fara'is of ghusl are three. Which is the first one? Gargling. Making sure that water enters the mouth, you gargle it, and then water comes out from the mouth. This is the first farz. And then the second farz is, Urdu mein isko kya kate? Kulli karna. The second farz is, putting water in your nostrils. That is the second farz. And then the third farz, very simple, pouring water on your entire body. Making sure that the water passes throughout the entire body, your whole body is washed. This is the three fars. So if you've covered the three fars, a person does, is not requ- required to do wudu again. So after performing ghusl, if he came to the masjid and he said, Allahu Akbar, that is fine. But obviously, he has missed out from a very important sunnah of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam, And therefore it is very important, brothers, when we do ghusl, not to miss out from this very important sunnah, which is to do wudu. All of the companions would do wudu. Generally, it was their habit, following the sunnah of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that whilst doing ghusl, they would even do wudu. Now, when you're doing wudu, if you are sitting, a person can stand and a person can sit and do ghusl. That is not a problem. But if he was sitting and doing ghusl, for an example, on, on a stool and the water is passing, the flow of water is very fast from beneath the feet, and the water does not accumulate there in the bathtub, then the ulama have mentioned it is better for him to do the complete wuzu. But if there was a possibility that waste water was to touch any part of his body whilst doing ghusl, then it is better to postpone the washing of the feet. Leave that for the last. But nowadays what happens is that unless there's a problem with the bathtub and the water accumulates in the tub, then that is a, that is a different issue. But if, if it's a quick flow, the water is running fast, then a person should just do the entire wuzu, which is the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So first you have to wash your hands and then wash your private parts and then do wuzu like how a person does wuzu for salah and then it was the habit of rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam scholars have mentioned that then after wuzu a person should pour water over his head three times over his head three times now in the hadith that we have in front of us here a special sequence or a manner has been explained at times rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would dip his fingers into that container, the water vessel, and then with the water, Allah's Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would rub his fingers on the head, on the head. Now another riwayat which is in Bayhaqi, because Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had long hair, zulfa, Allah's Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would divide the hair into two sections, the right section and the left section. So Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would pour water on the right section first and with the fingers he would make sure that the water reaches the base of the, of the head and to the roots of the hair, making sure that water reaches the head completely and then the same to the left side. That is the sunnah method of how one should wash the hair. This is very very important. 
In one hadith, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said that Janabat is under every hair. Janabat is under every hair. And when Hazrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala an heard this hadith of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he decided that he was to keep the hair very short. He decided that he's going to keep the hair very short. So whenever you, you hear of the description of Hazrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala an, a very strong built man but with short hair, with short hair, uh, something like this, something like this almost, so very short hair, and I think you should take permission from your wife first, Omar, and ask her how she wants your hairstyle. Inna lillahi wa inna ilahi raji'un. You'll find a lot of youth today, uh, hair short from here, and then very long from here, and short here, and long here, and goodness knows Allahu Akbar what kind of fashion this is. But this style of cutting hair is haram. What is it? This style of cutting hair is haram. Naha Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam anil qaza'i. And this hadith is in Abu Dawood Sharif. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not like people who cut their hair unevenly. And the hair should be cut properly. The hair should be cut properly. If a person likes long hair, then he has an option. He should leave zulf. And if he wants short hair, then the zulf can be to the earlobe or halfway to the ears. Or even long hair that would touch the shoulders. Now, in the case when a person, when a man has to carry out gusle jana, but even for some reason, if he has got very long hair or he has tied the hair or like how women uh, have um, buns mm. uh, buns and uh, plates or pl- plat, plats, plats something that will tie mm-hmm. the hair even if uh, a man had hair just like that what would happen is that in the sharia the sharia demands from him that he has to loosen the hair and to wash the hair but in the case of a woman concession is given to a woman if she has got shortly or if her hair is tied uh, or she's, she's put on a bun or every part of the hair because ladies generally have very long hair and to loosen the hair is quite difficult for them so Sharia has given them this concession they don't have to wash the hair completely but if the water was to reach the roots of the head all the way inside if the water reaches the roots then insha'Allah her ghusl has been completed. That is the difference between the ghusl of a man and the difference uh, between a man and a woman in the method of doing ghusl. Other than that, it is all the same for a man and a woman. This is the tartib of doing ghusl uh, in accordance to the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If you have earrings or somebody is wearing a ring, uh, make sure that you either take it out or uh, it's loose so that water passes from the ring and even the earrings have to be removed a lot of the times people don't realize that even the navel has to be washed ye jo hissa hai na belly button jisko kehte water must also reach inside and also a person should wash the ear this is the complete manner of doing ghusl in accordance to the sunnah of rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam then he must pour water on the right side, right shoulder thrice, three times. And then he must pour water to the left side, three times, thrice. And then Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam would pour water on his entire body. This is the manner of uh, doing ghusl in accordance to the sunnah of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam. One very important masla is that a lot of the people don't make intention when they are doing ghusl. A person should make intention that I am doing ghusl with the intention of attaining paki. To attain purity. To attain purity. Why? If you make the intention, there is reward for you. If there is no intention, there is no reward. So make sure you have an intention when you are doing ghusl. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you reward for even carrying out ghusl. Now how much water should a person 
use when doing ghusl. Allahu Akbar. A lot of people take hours in the ghusl khana, eh, Musa? Bhai? <laughs> Translation Musa Bai enjoys his time in the bathtub. Now, we need to understand because today with the uh, facilities that we have, we don't realize how much water we waste. Uh, and, and at times this can also uh, lead a person to commit a sin, wasting water. And so he has to be very, very careful. Now, going in the bathroom does not mean that he's wasting water. He might be doing something, whatever he needs to do. But we, here we are talking about how much water must be used when a person does ghusl. It comes in the hadith of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that Allah's Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would do wuzu in one mud. In one mud. Now, mud in Arabic is a measurement. Is a measurement which is approximately 810 milliliters. Kitne? 810 milliliters. That means Allah's Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would complete his wuzu in less than one liter of water. In less than one liter of water. Now compare our wuzu to the wuzu of Rasul sallallahu. Our wuzu is like ghusl. <laughs> our wuzu is like 810 milliliters. Working out the measurements in Arabic. 810, less than one liter. And that, that would suffice for Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in his wuzu. And then Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha was questioned with regards to the manner of how Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would do his ghusl and how much water he would use. She says, Kuntu أغتسل أنا والنبي صلى الله عليه وسلم من إناء واحد من قدح يقال له الفرق أن إن نظر رواية تسيس فدعت ب بإناء نحوي من ساع رسول صلى الله عليه وسلم for his ghusl would use one sa he would use one sa in the next hadith has a Jabir bin Abdullah a person came to him a sahabi and questioned him that how much water do I need for doing ghusl and he said, Yakfika sa'un. For you, one sa' is enough. For you, one sa' is enough. He said, Fakal rajulun. And the man said, Ma yakfini. No, no, no. One sa' is not enough for me. One sa' is not enough for me. Uh, there's a lot of body mass to cover. And so, Hazrat Jabir radiallahu ta'ala and said, Yakfi man huwa awfa minka sha'aran wa khayrun minka. One sa' of water was sufficient for the one who was who had more hair than you and who was better than you. One sa was enough for that person who had more hair than you and who was more better than you. Referring to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So what is one sa? Especially in the times of the credit crunch that we are going through and the soaring prices of gas and electricity bills if we could all make amal on one sa'a believe me it would be very very cheap for us alhamdulillah and it is only a sunnah so what is one sa'a one sa'a we've had it here uh, measured one sa'a is approximately 3.24 liters one sa'a is musabai you enjoy ghusl but the hadith speaks otherwise uh, 3.24 liters would suffice for Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in doing ghusl. Just, 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 just above 4 liters. Say just above 4 liters. When you work out the sa' and break it up into the muds that are there, just above 4 liters. So Allah's Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would only use 4 liters. Now, we have been spoiled living in England. There's a lot of water, alhamdulillah. But if you go to countries where there is, there is no water, mm -hmm. subhanallah, you'll see them to use water sparingly. Mm -hmm. They'll use water very sparingly. And they make qadr of water. Mm -hmm. 
But here we have a lot of water. And also with the shower system that we have, we don't even realize how much water uh, is coming out and how much water is being wasted. But Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa and that is why some people say that uh, if you have a shower, that is better, so that it's easy for a person to uh, attain purity and making sure that the water uh, reaches all the, the entire body. Uh, but if you are conscious of saving water, it would be the traditional buckets and the taps that are there and sitting. The bucket is the answer. And at least you know how much water you are using. So this is the sunnah of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Scholars have mentioned that the best option today would be to use water in moderation. To use water in moderation. Don't waste too much water. This is against the sharia and also against the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Some of the people take a lot of time in carrying out, in doing their ghusl. Allah knows what they are doing. But... Uh, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was very fast in his ghusl. Now just to explain how fast Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was. We have one hadith here narrated by Hazrat Abu Huraira radiyallahu ta'ala. A lot of masail come out from this one hadith. Hazrat Abu Huraira says that uqimatis salah, the iqamat of salat was given. Wa'uddilatis sufuf, and the safs were straightened. فَخَرَجَ إِلَيْنَا رَسُولُ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمُ And Rasul صلى الله عليه وسلم came out from his room. فَلَمَّا قَامَ فِي مُسَلَّهُ And when Rasul صلى الله عليه وسلم stood on his musalla, ذَكَرَ أَنَّهُ جُنُبٌ Rasul صلى الله عليه وسلم realized that he is junubi in the state of janabat. Now, these moments came to Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so that it becomes a means of hidayat and education for the rest of the ummah. Why? Because Allah's Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is khatamun nabiyyin and the sharia is the last sharia. So every possible mas'ala that could that an ummati could have faced if it would not denigrate the position of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would put Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in that position. Why? Because he is the best personality to explain the Masail to the Ummah. And that is the reason why a lot of these uh, incidents occurred in the time of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and it can happen to anybody. Mm -hmm. Janabat does not mean that a person has physically gone through a relationship uh, mm -hmm. in a room with his wife and then obviously that is something that he will not forget. But Janabat basically means if semen is discharged from the private organ mm -hmm. and a person might not even realize this and he could come to the masjid and only then he will realize that oh ho, Ghusl Janabat is falls on me. Mm -hmm. So it is not jaiz, it is unlawful for a person in that state of Janabat and also a woman in menses to enter the masjid. And these are the laws for the Muslimin. These are the laws for the Muslimin. So Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam realized that he was in that state of ghusl. So he looked at all of the companions and he said makanakum stay in your place and then Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went back to his hujra in his room فاغتسل and Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did ghusl ثم خرج إلينا and then Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came back to us very quickly ورأسه يقتر and there was water dripping from the head auspicious head of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so that the, the hair was wet فكبر and then Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made takbir and he said Allahu Akbar فصلينا معه and we prayed with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that shows that Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not waste time when he entered the ghusl khana to do ghusl and I remember clearly our teacher Mufti Shabbir Saab of Darul Ulum he would often say that it should only take a person 8 minutes to do ghusl 
how, how many minutes? Eight, eight minutes to do. Uh, you are not there in a swimming pool enjoying yourself. No. MashaAllah, all you need to do is just to make sure that your body is clean. Your body is clean. And that is the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Again, there are a lot of masail. I've just missed out one hadith here uh, in which the muhaddisin have mentioned that if a person is in that state of janabat, should he carry out ghusl immediately or there is respite for him, time is given to him. One or two ahadiths, Prophet Anas radiallahu ta'ala an uh, narrates one hadith here. Kana Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yaduru ala nisa'ihi fi sa'ati al-wahidati min al-layli wa nahar Allah's Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would visit all of his wives. There, there have been uh, some occasions uh, in the life of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that in one night, or should I say, uh, Yaduru would mean in one round, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would meet all of his wives. And we have to make sure that, uh, you know, we don't take this lightly. We are talking about the greatest human being here. Mm-hmm. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it is not a joke. Or, no, no. Uh, a person needs to laugh, aliyazu billah. These are very important masail that we need to understand and and we have to be serious about it because we are talking about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So in one night at times he would visit 11 wives. And in one revival it says that Allah's Nabi had 9 wives. Because in the time of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Bibi Khadijah al-Kubra, and if I don't make a mistake, I think it was Hazrat Zainab, she also passed away. So... Eleven or nine wives of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Some of the companions were saying that Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had so much power and so much strength. Mm -hmm. And here the scholars have debated whether a person should do ghusl for every janabat. For every janabat or there is respite and time given to him that he can do one ghusl every time he meets or engages with his partner. So this again is a separate issue. According to the scholars, uh, one ghusl will suffice for him. One ghusl will suffice for him. Uh, another very important issue is, can a person uh, get completely naked whilst doing ghusl? Some of the scholars were of the opinion that when, when doing ghusl, he must put on something maybe some shorts or something that would cover the private parts but majority of the scholars give permission that if a person is in a place where nobody can see him then for him to get naked and to do ghusl in that manner it is completely jais which is the opinion of the majority of the scholars and Imam Bukhari rahmatullah alayhi, it seems that he is also of this opinion because he puts forward one hadith of Rasulullah sure. sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is an incredible hadith. It just shows how shameless uh, Banu Israel were, the Jewish community who uh, followed the teachings of Hazrat Musa alayhi salatu wa salam. And so Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam makes mention here of an incident that occurred during the time of Hazrat Musa alayhi salam. Allah's Nabi says, كَانَتْ بَنُوا إِسْرَائِيلُ يَخْتَسِلُونَ عُرَاتًا That Banu Israel were in the habit of doing ghusl in complete nakedness. In complete nakedness. يَنْزُرُوا بَعْضُهُمْ إِلَى بعض. In fact, they would look at each other. They would even look at each other. Maybe there was... Uh, some kind of a special room or an area where they would all gather and sit and meet and do ghusl and look at each other completely naked. Now, don't forget that in Islam, subhanallah, Sharia does not promote nudity or nakedness uh, in any way, but rather haya, bashfulness, uh, concealment. This is something that is highly recommended in Sharia. But at times of necessity, Islam gives permission. For an example, you need to go to a doctor. And if the doctor says that I have to check you, and this part must be exposed. Mm -hmm. Now there is a necessity. So even for a woman, it should be better that she is checked by a female doctor. Mm -hmm. But in a case where 
an operation has to take place and a woman has no choice for this man is a, a, is a specialist, then fatwas are given that it is jais, of course, with consulting the doctors and also the scholars. When a person needs to go to the toilet, when a person uh, is with the wife, or any other circumstances, uh, sometimes due to necessity a person might have to open up certain parts of the body which is acceptable. Also in the case of ghusl, because it is a necessity, sharia gives permission. Sharia gives permission because it is a necessity. But here the Banu Israel would look, look at each other and talk and enjoy and it was like an outing for them, like how people go to the swimming pool. And they were accusing Musa alayhi salatu wasalam. Why? Because Musa alayhi salatu wasalam would do ghusl alone. وَكَانَ مُوسَى يَغْتَسِلُ وَحْدَهُ Musa alayhi salatu wasalam would do ghusl by himself all alone. And Banu Israel was saying, وَاللَّهِ مَا يَمْنَعُ مُوسَى يَغْتَسِلَ مَعَنَا إِلَّا أَنَّهُ آدَلْ لَا حَوْلَ وَلَا قُوَّةَ إِلَّا بِاللَّهِ They said that Musa alayhi salatu wasalam is not doing ghusl with us where we are. Why? Because he has uh, some disability. He has some disability. And other would be translated as scrotal hernia. Because he is suffering from scrotal hernia. That would mean where the testicles become very large. Where the testicles become very large. And these people were so shameless that they would even speak about their own Nabi. And a, and a Nabi like Musa alayhi salam, <laughs> do you think they will have respect for any resolution that is passed by the United Nations? <laughs> you know, when people talk to me that a resolution is going to be passed by the United Nations or whatever, I start laughing. I start laughing. Since when have the Israelis and the Zionist regime have respected any resolutions. Since when? When they could not even respect their own Nabi Musa alayhi salatu was salam. Are they going to have respect for the, for the people of Gaza? And they said that he suffers from scrotal hernia. From scrotal hernia. Where, uh, and this is known as Adar. Adar in Urdu. And so Musa alayhi salatu was salam would do ghusl alone once perhaps in a river somewhere on one side Musa alayhi salatu was salam was doing ghusl and this time Hazrat Musa alayhi salam physically was very very strong and very handsome all the prophets were handsome all the prophets were very handsome very beautiful it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who gave them the best features why? because of the features they would appeal to the society to the people that were around them so they were given the right height, a beautiful face, beautiful features, a beautiful body. And Musa alayhi salam was also a very handsome man. And Musa alayhi salam very casually now taking out his clothes. And there was a rock there, a stone or a rock. And he put the jabba on the rock and he was doing ghusl. And now again, this is the, the amr, the command of Allah. The rock, the rock fled with the clothes of Hazrat A. Musa alayhi salatu wasalam. Fafarra al hajar bi sawbi. And Musa alayhi salam is in the river doing ghusl. And, and the clothes that was on that rock, and the rock took it somewhere at a distance. And Musa alayhi salatu wasalam got very angry. Fakharaja Musa fi isrihi. And Musa alayhi salatu wasalam started chasing the rock. And in the hadith it comes, Allah's Nabi said, Sawbi ya hajar, sawbi ya hajar, sawbi ya hajar. O oh, rock my clothes, O oh, rock my clothes, O oh, rock my clothes. And again Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to free him from the blame of Banu Israel. These were people who had no respect for anyone, let alone a great Nabi like Musa alayhi salam. And there was a group of Banu Israel there. Very quickly, very quickly, Musa alayhi salatu was salam passed from them and the and, and, the, and the rock just stopped there and Hazrat Musa alayhi salatu wasalam picked up his clothes and quickly put it on but there were people there that saw the body of Rasul Hazrat Musa alayhi salatu wasalam from one side and just looking at the features 
of Musa alayhi salatu wa salam they said wallahi ma bi Musa min ba'sin Musa alayhi salatu wa salam is not suffering from any kind of deformity he is not suffering from any kind of deformity and wa akhadha thawbahu Musa alayhi salatu wa salam got very angry with that stone started beating it what did Musa alayhi salam do? Started beating it. And Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala an is the narrator, that by the beats of Musa alayhi salatu wa salam, six to seven marks were visible on that stone. Ab Musa alayhi salam ki mark aise hogi bhai? Do you remember when he slapped that, uh, slapped Malakul Maut? Do you remember that incident? He slapped Malakul Maut and he slapped that person. Uh, in Egypt and with one slap he passed away so physically Hazrat Musa alayhi salatu was was very strong so Imam Bukhari has recorded this hadith showing that it is permissible for a person to take off all the clothes and do ghusl that is jais in another hadith Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam here has mentioned and just to very quickly explain to you Hazrat Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala an met Hazrat well he was about to meet Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in one of the streets of Madinatul Munawwara fan khanastu minhu and Hazrat Abu Huraira from a distance saw Hazrat Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he slipped away what did he do? and he slipped away but Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saw him Allah's Nabi said after a while Hazrat Abu Huraira came and Allah's Nabi said to him Aina kunta ya Abu Huraira where were you? <laughs> Where were you? And Hazrat Abu Huraira thought that maybe Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not see him. And he said to Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Kuntu junuban. Ya Rasulullah, I was in the state of Janabat. Fakarihtu an ujalisaka wa ana ala ghayri tuhara. Um, I dislike the thought to sit with you in that state of Janaba. And therefore I quickly went back to do ghusl and I did ghusl and only then I came to you Allah's Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said subhanallah inna al-mu'mina la yanjus a believer does not become impure a, belie- a believer does not become impure. impure now this mas'ala is very very important my respected brothers we have adopted a lot of Hinduism and Hindu culture is with us unfortunately even if a woman is in her menses, in, in some parts of the world, even Muslims, she is not allowed to cook food, <coughs> she is not even allowed to share the same bed with the husband, she is not even allowed to iron the clothes, she is not allowed to do nothing. Why? They say that she is napak, impure. Allahu Akbar. And even a man, if he is in that state, as if he... He would make life so difficult for himself. Mm-hmm. Now in Sharia, permission is given for a person to slightly postpone ghusl. Although it was always the habit of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to do ghusl very quickly. And this is the sunnah. But at times to postpone it is permissible. And that is why Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Is it jaiz for... Hazrat Umar ibn al-Khattab said to Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Is it permissible for a person to sleep if he is in the state of janabat? Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Yes, if he does wuzu. Yes, if he does wuzu. Now this hadith has been explained by the muhaddisin that even if he was not to do wuzu, according to the majority of the scholars, it is permissible for him to do for him to sleep without doing ghusl but again to do jihad and to do ghusl mashallah this would be an act of virtue on his behalf but if he slept and then before fajr if he did ghusl this is also acceptable so rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam what allah's nabi is saying that physically the believe the believer is not impure so this is just a metaphorical impurity this is just a uh, a, a ritual impurity, a metaphorical impurity. If you were to touch someone who is in the state of janabat, that does not mean that you've touched someone that is napak and that you are napak. Mm-hmm. Allahu Akbar. Yeah. A believer is clean all the time. Mm-hmm. But because this is the hukam, this is the laws of sharia, mm-hmm. that there is this ritual impurity and therefore he has to do ghusl. This is the order of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But generally a believer 
is not napak, not impure. That is why even in the state of janabat, his saliva and his sweat is pure and pak. This is something which is very, very important. Last hadith, my respected brothers. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said, this is an important hadith, إِذَا جَلَسَ بَيْنَ شُعَ بِهَا الْأَرْبَعْ ثُمَّ جَهَدَهَا فَقَدْ وَجَبَ الْغُسْلِ The translation is, when a man sits between the four parts of a woman, when a man sits between the four parts of a woman, then he exerts himself against her, then ghusl is farz on both of them. Then ghusl is farz on both of them. Now this hadith is very very important. In the beginning, in the early days of Islam, concession was given to the believers that if a person was to engage in physical relationship with his wife, and in that relationship uh, there was no seminal discharge then ghusl was not farz on him he would only have to do wuzu he would only have to do wuzu that was in the beginning but because of this hadith of rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam the previous laws have been abrogated so this hadith is the abrogating hadith So when the front section of the private organ of the man enters, the front section of the private part of a woman, when it enters, then ghusl becomes farz. Remember, not just by touching, not just by touching, then ghusl is not farz. But the front section of the private organ of a man should enter the front section, the front part of the private part of the lady, then only ghusl is farz. Whether whether there is a discharge of semen or not, in any case ghusl would be farz on him. But it is always better that a person, if he is in that condition, to do ghusl. These are just some of the masail explained here with regards to ghusl. What is very very important is that we do ghusl in accordance to the sunnah of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Five minutes extra. But gargle your mouth, mashallah. And by doing wuzu, you will notice that subhanallah, you will feel very fresh. Before your ghusl, if you do wuzu, you will feel very very fresh. Because there is a lot of hikmah and wisdom in the acts of the sunnah. Of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Wa akhiru da'wana Alhamdulillahi rabbil alayhi wa sallam Allahumma salli ala sayyidina wa nabiyyina wa maulana Muhammadin nabiyyini wa ala alihi wa sallim baslima Allahumma taqubal minna wa tuba alayna inna kanda tawar rahim Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk Samina wa ta'ana gufranak rabbana wa ilayk al-masir Bi rahmatika ya rahmatahim